Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers, the Carb Addiction Doc, and today we're going to, call, we're going to talk uh, in detail about the commonest cause of death in this country, and that is coronary artery vascular disease. So plaques that rupture, plaques that clot, go up to the brain, cause a stroke, cause a heart attack, and can kill you. And the two primary, or the, the primary cause of plaque accumulation in the blood vessels is related to inflammation of the blood vessels and clotting. And it's so important to understand this. Uh, the plaque formation is ultimately a clotting disorder and an inflammation disorder, not a lipid or a fat disorder. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is how do you test, how do you establish for yourself what your cardiovascular risk is, how bad are my vessels right now because I've kind of been smoking and, de- and eating a bad diet. What are those risks and how do I monitor them going forward and what should I, what are the call to actions and what can I do to reduce this? So at first, the first part of this is talk, to talk about the nature of the disease and give you some statistics. And then at the end, I will give you, in my mind, from in our practice, the best algorithm you can do to arrest the progression of this disease, maybe reverse it just a little bit, but also do the best for your health going forward. Folks, you know, I've done a recent little experiment. As you can see, I'm wearing a G7, a Dexcom G7 CGM. So I know what my blood sugars are every five minutes. I typically run fairly low. And you know that I drink heavy cream in my coffee every morning. And the purpose of the heavy cream is to get me into ketosis. Some people put butter in their coffee. Some people put MCT oil in it. Some people put heavy cream in. And this morning, I happened to put whole milk, not heavy cream in my coffee because I didn't have any heavy cream. And my blood sugar went up by 38 points, by 38 points in the course of 15 minutes and took about an hour and a half to come back down below 100. That's scary, that's scary. So I did an experiment. Instead of putting cream in my coffee, I used Ketone IQ. And Ketone IQ is a ketogenic product that also does what the milk in my coffee does. It puts me into ketosis and prevents me from eating. And the paradox is that when I had my morning coffee with ketones instead of cream or milk, my blood sugar went down by six points. It went down by six points, and I don't know how long it stayed there because it, I fluctuated a little bit, but it stayed level. There was no bump. It stayed flat. So this stuff in the morning, uh, it also gives you a bit of a boost. But in the morning, instead of my um, cream, instead of my whole milk, um, and certainly I'm not a fan of putting MCT oil and butter in my coffee. I just don't like the taste. Or coconut, I just don't like the taste. It, it, it's fine to get you in ketosis. This is an alternative. If you're interested in trying, the promo code is down below in the show notes. So just briefly, if you think about cardiovascular disease, what happens is when you either use nicotine or more importantly, massively more importantly, like a fart against thunder. Everyone thinks nicotine's so bad. Yes, nicotine's terrible, whether it's vaping or smoking. But what's of a greater magnitude, the evidence says, far worse than nicotine in terms of cardiovascular risk is chronically elevated blood sugar that may potentially end up in diabetes. And that chronically elevated blood sugar causes inflammation of the blood vessels. I've got another video that shows that. And it forms a little clot, and the final part of the clot is to layer down a lipid layer, a cholesterol layer, that smooths that clot over. And these clots are occurring in the big blood vessel, but also, here's the bizarre part, every big blood vessel has little blood vessels that feed the big blood vessel, okay? And the same plaque orientation is occurring at a sub-intimal level inside of the walls of these big blood vessels. So not only do we have the steady progression of the plaque narrowing the blood vessel, to the point that you don't get enough blood flow to the heart, you don't get enough oxygen or uh, food going to the uh, muscle of the heart, and a portion of that muscle can become ischemic, which gives you chest pain, and then especially if you're exercising or you need your heart demands more, a piece of it doesn't get enough oxygen or, or food and it dies. And that's all the heart attack, okay? That's what a heart attack is. But alternatively, these plaques are unstable and they come in these little rough patches. And if you think about... Uh, Think about a tarred road where a tree root is growing under the tar. You've all seen it. And the tar first bulges out and it bulges into the lumen and then it cracks. And then when a truck goes over that, it can rupture. And then you've got a hole uh, in the blood vessel. So the clot forms, you can clot that vessel off. Or 
that ruptured por portion of tar can fly up and smash a windshield of an oncoming car in the same way that plaque, that little collection of plaque can travel downstream and lodge in your brain and cause a stroke. So simplistically, that's what we're talking about. So we, we're talking about this, think literally of a tree root growing under a tarred road and it pushes it up, pushes it up, find a form a little crack. They come along, they seal up the crack, but they leave the bump there. And then the crack forms again, and either it, uh, the, the, the crack gets so high, the bump gets so high that it smashes cars, or a car or truck drives over it, it ruptures, and it flies off with the cause damage, which is the stroke or the distal heart attack. That's, that's what's happening in these blood vessels. And that is a response to the inflammation caused by elevated blood sugar levels or nicotine. And um, you can see from the slides over here, I've shown a beautiful progression of how this plaque slowly pro progresses in your blood vessels. And I want to give full credit. I have stolen, I've taken, I've been given actually permission um, by a wonderful guy. Um, and, and you will love him from every perspective, from the top of his head that doesn't exist, all the way down to his accent. Uh, the guy's name is Ivor Cummins. Very controversial man, but I love him to bits. I disagree with some of the stuff that he puts out there, but I really like what he's done. And this is a talk that he has done on uh, Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O. And um, I, will uh, I will leave in the show notes a link to this video. You can link to his CAC score video that he does with a guy called Gabor Erdosi. Neither of these two are, are doctors. They are engineers. I know Ivor is an engineer. So these guys are not medical doctors, but they tell a phenomenal biologic story of how plaques develop and then they look at the data and so the slides I'm sharing with you come predominantly from Ivor and you sometimes see a picture of him in the top corner of some of these slides I've left them there but I love 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 this talk and want to promote this because your cardiologist will not do this folks your cardiologist will not will not directly evaluate your plaque because they want you on a statin and the statin does nothing to the plaque very, very little. So we'll talk about that in a second. So um, the test that we use as physicians, except for the cardiologists who refused to get this test done, although the test was created by a cardiologist called Arthur Agatson. And Art, uh, Art Agatson is a friend of mine. He lives down here in Miami. He's the guy that wrote the South Beach Diet, but he created the CAC score. What's the CAC score? It's a CT scan. So if you look at the next slide, you'll see a guy lying on a table. That's the CT scanner. It's a special type of x-ray of your chest and they look at calcium on the x-ray. Calcium is a white uh, uh, little mark on you, in the blood vessel of your heart, and it can be seen on a CT scan. It's a simple CT scan, doesn't even require an IV. It's a non-contrast CT scan. You can't have, or you really shouldn't have, a CAC score done if you've already had a stent or coronary vessels. It's a different test we do for that. But for the majority of us, it's a monitoring tool, kind of like an x-ray. Uh, you spend a few minutes on the scanner and it, they calculate a CAC score. And here's what you want from your CAC score. Number one, you want the total score, the amount of plaque there is in your blood vessels. And the score will go from zero up and we'll go through that score in a second. The second thing you want is the distribution of that calcium. So the calcium can be distributed in your left anterior descending vessel, in your circumflex. Uh, there are four or five vessels of the heart that they look at. Those are the two dominant ones. Um, the LAD, for example, is called the Widowmaker. That's where uh, most of the plaque accumulates, but you may have RCA dominant disease. But you don't want to know, is the disease spread out over all the vessels or is it all in one vessel? Because that affects risk as well. The next the two things you want to know, and often they don't, they don't report this, so you want to ask them to report this, is the density of the plaque. And they can calculate by looking at the brightness of the plaque. They can tell, calculate the density of the plaque and also the volume of the plaque. So you need to know overall plaque uh, uh, percentage, the Agatson score. You need to know the distribution in which vessels and what percentage are in different vessels. And then you need to know the density and the volume of that plaque. And that's going to be important not only right away to as a call to action if you've got a lot of plaque, oh, I may need a stent, I may need something done, or I should take an aspirin or something like that. But also, um, as a baseline uh, to follow in sequential CAC scores over time, what's happening in your blood vessels? Is this thing progressing? Should I be worried? Is it arrested? Can I, uh, is it stopped? Can I stop worrying? 
if I change my diet, all of those things matter. And the CAC score, together with perhaps an exercise stress test, are the two single best tests you can have um, to evaluate cardiovascular risk. Okay, now here's what's interesting. Um, and I'll show the slide, the slide will pop up there. If you look at heart attack rate over 10 years by different age groups, and you can look at your own age group, okay? Those people, and this is where CAC score counts. So I'm gonna come back to this graph in a second. Before we go there, let me tell you what the CAC score means. If your CAC score is zero, you have no plaque. Mine is zero, for example, okay? And there is very low, not zero, but generally a less than 5% chance of developing coronary artery vascular disease over the next 10 years. And if you're not smoking, if you're not eating carbohydrates, and if you're obesogenic, that is by genetics, and you can't choose your genes, that's the best picture. That's going to give you a zero. Even if you've never smoked, you eat a low carbohydrate diet, but if you are genetically predisposed to hyperglycemia, if you are diabetogenic, not obesogenic, that puts you at a higher category of risk. And we can talk more about that on another video. Uh, and we will uh, with the next video. If your score is one to 10, it's a minimal amount. It's pr there's a little bit there, but it's as pretty much zero. You can, you can consider that to be about the same as zero. There's less than 10% chance it's going to propagate. And um, so for a zero, we recommend another scan in about 10 years. For a one to 10, we recommend a scan around five years is what I use, uh, especially if you're following a low carbohydrate diet, you're not smoking. Below 100 is low moderate disease. Anywhere below 100 is low moderate disease. The big issue with numbers below 100 is, is the plaque distributed evenly throughout multiple vessels where you've got less than a 10% narrowing? Or is the plaque that, that 1 to 100 score all in a very narrow, very tight area? I had a very close friend of mine, I'd have been a video on this at the age of 48, was having some chest pain, had a CAC score of 80. I've got another patient at 75. The, the cardiologist blew it off. I said, dude, go and get a study done. They got the study done. They had a very tight, narrow plaque, got a stent, and now they're fine. So um, you really want to look at distribution there. The next, uh, but, but below 100, if it's evenly distributed, low score, I'd probably get another score in about three, uh, two to three years to see if there's any progression. Then you can delay or increase the frequency. But unless the distribution is in a very narrow area, no call to action. For a CAC score of, of 100, uh, 100 to 400, that is moderately high risk. And that is where I would begin to see a cardiologist. Uh, below 100, if you have that with chest pain, see a cardiologist, especially chest pain under exercise, see a cardiologist. Otherwise, follow the algorithm I'm going to give at the end of this talk and have another test done in three to five years. If you are 100 to 400, I would go and visit a sympathetic cardiologist to get a stress test um, and to evaluate that plaque a little bit better. If the stress test is positive, I would then have an angiogram um, to look at the plaque and maybe stent or balloon the plaque. That's kind of the progression because you don't want the heart attack. Um, but that's the process. What they'll do is they'll do EKGs, they'll do echoes, they'll do all ancillary crap. Um, to my mind, for cardiovascular disease, I'm not a cardiologist, I defer to them, but I will get a CAC score uh, progress to an exercise stress test, and then maybe a coronary angiogram, because that's how you treat this disease. Maybe a CT angiogram in between to see, with a little bit slightly better imaging, what the plaque looks like. Certainly if you're over 400, go and see a cardiologist. Go and get those tests done. And certainly if my score was over 400, I would want, and I know this is going to be controversial, I would want a coronary artery angiogram done where they put a needle in, they squirt and they look at pressures and they look at where my plaque is. But I want it done by a cardiologist, an interventional cardiologist that can keep their hands in their pocket. That will not stent just because they're there. That will not intervene, but you want the gold standard knowledge. And the reason I, I want a squirt, I want a... Uh, an angiogram, a, uh, an injected angiogram with a catheter up there, is you want to be able to measure the pressure differential across plaque. You want to see flow across the plaque. You want to look at how well your heart is working. And together with a stress test, you can see if there's any threat to your heart in terms of heart attack. Now, 
The other part also is if the plaque is very heaped up, even if you're on a carnivore diet, and I've had patients come to me and say, well, I had a heart attack when my, I was on a carnivore diet for two years and I had a heart attack and the carnivore diet caused that and you guys are all terrible and my cardiologist says I need to eat lots of fruit and vegetables. Bullshit. But here's where the bullshit comes in, is that person had what's called a plaque rupture. They had plaque from their previous high carbohydrate smoking disease and they had a little heaped up area. Remember I talked about that uh, um, piece of tarred road that then ruptures and a piece breaks off. So they get their stroke, they have the heart attack from pre-existing plaque that ruptures. That you may want to stent, you may want to balloon it, although we found there's no real benefit to ballooning the little ones, but you also want to prevent clot propagation under those conditions and that's where a baby aspirin comes in. We'll consolidate that, but if you're over 400, definitely see a cardiologist whose primary job is not to put you on a statin and say come back next year. That's the problem with cardiologists. So find a sympathetic cardiologist, one that understands this disease and take action. But also make sure you get further CAC scores done over time, maybe every year or every two years to look at disease progression. Now, how can I confidently say that? How can I confidently say that? What is the evidence to be able to say that? Well, here's the evidence. And look at this next slide. Look at your age group. And it looks at age group of 45 to 54. A lot younger than me, 45 to 54. You don't want to have a heart attack at that age. You don't want to have a heart attack at all. If your CAC score is zero, you've got less than a 1% risk of a heart attack in 10 years. Okay? If your CAC score is less than 100, that risk is still below 5%. It's about 3 or 4%. But if your CAC score is above 100, just 100, not the 400, just above 100, your 10-year risk of a heart attack is 22 to 23%. It's high. Look at this graph. Okay? And as you get older, that risk does go up, especially the risk of a heart attack in the CAC school 1 to 100. And here's the interesting thing, that the highest risk of a heart attack is in the age group 65 to 74, because that's where the plaque is progressing. Once you get over 75 years of age, while the risk is still high depending on the category, the risk actually is less from 75 to 84 than it is 65 to 74 unless you've got the, the, the very high CAC scores because you've already stood the test of time. The people that are going to get the heart attacks and the strokes uh, in their 80s are much lower than those who've already died of the disease in their 60s. So once you survive beyond 75 and you're in fairly good shape, you're probably going to live a pretty decent length of time. So therefore, do something about this. Um, but that's just an interesting side. Now, here's the other part is we know that we got into all of this and we got into all of this trouble because of the, the, the mismanagement of smoking in the 1950s and 60s. But smoking used to be the primary cause of cardiovascular disease and it was measurable. And so if you look at uh, a low CAC score, less than 10, in people who don't smoke, one out of 100 people um, are at risk of a heart attack in five years. So very, very low risk. If you're a smoker, now there are not a lot of smokers who have a CAC score under, 100, uh, under 10. But if you are that small volume of smokers or vapors that have a CAC score less than 10, after five years, that number is doubled. About two out of 100 will have a heart attack or a stroke or die. Actually, will die of a heart attack or a stroke. So... Smoking with a low CAC score, only, although only a tiny fraction of the population has this, smoking with a low CAC score um, is actually pretty safe. So if you are a smoker uh, or are a vapor, get that CAC score done. Not that it says keep on vaping because you don't know about lung cancer and the other things, but certainly from a cardiovascular perspective, definitely get a CAC score and see what that is. Certainly if you're diabetic or pre-diabetic, have that done as well. And Certainly, I'd be happy to order that. It's part of the routine that we order in our new patients when warranted. Here's the interesting thing. Non-smokers, if you're a non-smoker and you have a CAC score higher than 1,000, irrespective of age, 12 out of 100 are going to be dead in five years of a heart attack or a stroke. So, irrespective of the score, uh, or at least... Sorry, excluding smokers. So if you have a CAC score above 1,000 and the primary cause of that high CAC score is diabetes, is 
elevated blood sugar, inflammation from elevated blood sugar, those are the people that get the score above 1,000. You have a 12% risk of dying, dying, not just having, but dying of a heart attack or a stroke in the next five years. And that is a problem. It, it kind of shows, it puts smoking into perspective. It doesn't negate it, but it puts it into perspective. And in this next slide, you can see that if you have a low CAC score, yes, there is a significant increase in diabetics, but the risk of mortality uh, with a starting score of zero, whether you're diabetic or not, uh, is low, but the risk goes up if you're diabetic. However, if you have a starting CAC score of 400 and you're diabetic, the risk of a heart attack or a stroke over 15 years is through the roof enormous. It is horrible. So please, please, please treat that diabetes. And the thing you want to treat is your type 2 component, your hypoglycemic. Whether you're a type 1 or a type 2, the type 1s actually have insulin resistance. So it's the insulin resistance that you want to treat to zero. And then your risk comes down to that equivalent of non-diabetics. But please, 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 that's the call to action. And the action is two-part. See the cardiologist to help to manage existing disease. If you need a stent or something like that, do not see them for medication or advice to reduce that risk. They know nothing about nutrition. They'll give you bad advice. And they will not use the appropriate medication for the most part. That is where you want to partner with a metabolic health specialist that can help you to deal with your insulin resistance. So the partnership of cardiologists and metabolic health should be partnered tightly, not at loggerheads with each other. And I'm here to tell a cardiovascular story. I'm not going to do the cardiovascular technical work. At the same time, the cardiologist should be the technical work and the thinking about the specific heart disease, but shouldn't be giving you dietary advice and statins. That's just the way uh, that we think about this, and that's the issue. So the next uh, um, uh, side of things is that if you have a CAC score of 100 to 1,000, okay, you over the next 15 years, if you don't change anything, you are at a 50% risk of dying of a heart attack or a stroke. 50%. That is a massive incidence if you continue to live your life that way. So the likelihood is, uh, sorry, the, the score increases 15% per year. 15% per year if your score is 100 to 1,000. Plot just increases. If you, if you change, if you make changes to your diet and the changes I'm about to recommend, you can reduce that risk over a 15-year course from 50%, 15% per year, down to 3%, 3%. Think about that, folks. You've gone from 50% risk to 3% risk if your score is 100 to 1,000 just by eating this way. Not zero, but you can radically lower it. So what is the algorithm? And, and one of the things that, that just as a, side, as a side here, what happens, so why, does that, why is that the case? Yes, you're at risk for plaque rupture, but... If the plaque, what happens with a plaque when you, when you reduce inflammation, and there are a variety of different things we use to reduce inflammation, we'll talk about them in the final part of this, what's your call to action? So if you correct the cause of the problem, you get rid of the inflammation, the plaque stays, it doesn't go away. But the plaque for, becomes increasingly dense. It becomes more solid. It's less likely to rupture. It's less likely to be this big fluffy plaque. It becomes more solid. And so the plaque density increases and the volume decreases. So the number stays the same, may even go slightly down, but the plaque quality gets better. It's not the soft plaque that can just rupture. It becomes hard plaque. Like an old scar, you've got, you cut yourself, you've got that fresh stuff. That's the progression, that's the dangerous plaque. But if it forms a solid scar, and it's this hard scar, that's the old disease, doesn't go away, but is a lower threat to you. So what's the call to action? The first call to action is, number one, if your score is above 100, and definitely above 400, reasonable to go and have a visit with a cardiologist, get an EKG, and get a... A stress test, preferably if you can do it, an exercise stress test, if not a chemical stress test. And if there's any changes in the stress test, get a coronary artery angiogram where they go in through your groin or through your wrist and they inject dye because they can look at pressures and they can potentially intervene. But make sure it's not by a Yahoo cowboy guy. Make sure it's by a, a doc um, 
that can keep their hands in their pockets, that doesn't stent everything they see. But then at least you've got a baseline. And for those folks, I would get a CAC score on a regular basis. Now, what are the strategies that you can do yourself to lower your risk, irrespective if you're at a zero or at a thousand score? Irrespective of where you are, what can you do to minimize your risk? Okay. Number one, number one, get blood work done. Come and see me, get blood work done. Because one of the things you want to know is, are you obesogenic or are you diabesogenic? The obesogenic people have a much, much lower risk than the diabesogenic. You can be thin and healthy. You can be extremely fit and have a heart attack because you are diabesogenic. And, and, and I know this is going to sound horrible, but it's not uncommon to see that person, that body floating in the water during the swim part of a triathlon where that very healthy person doing Ironman had a heart attack in the water. Okay, why? Because they're obese, because they're diabesogenic and they hadn't had their CAC score done. So the first thing is get the blood work done. Come and see me. We will get that blood work done and we'll analyze it for you so you can know what that starting risk is. Because if you're diabesogenic and your risk is a, and your score is a 50 or an 80, I would still be more aggressive about following you and tracking you. If your score is a zero or even if it's a 40 or a 50, but you're obesogenic, the risk is lower. There are other risks. So understand that, and most doctors out there, even in our space, doesn't understand that genetic risk stratification based on insulin production. Watch the next video that I'm about to record and will release after this one that explains that. So the therapy, number one, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Whether it's more on the plant-based, whether it's more animal-based, I don't care, plants and animals together, but getting rid of carbohydrates and increasing your fat consumption. And with that, I'm going to say this, increasing your salt consumption. Okay, so the single best thing you can do is to lower your blood sugar, lower the inflammation and to get your A1C at 5.2 or lower where your A1C is no longer an inflammatory risk to your blood vessels. So number one, ketogenic diet. Number two, some form of physical activity as a, an intentional mandate every day to the extent you can, oh, I can't exercise, I've got bad knees. Bullshit. There's nothing wrong with your hands, if, and especially if you're fat. Believe me, you do lots of exercise, but it doesn't count, okay? So call yourself out on that. And I didn't use the word exercise. It's physical activity to whatever extent you can do, and frequency has greater value than, uh, uh, than intensity. And I said that. The HIIT training, all that kind of thing, absolutely fine to do, but don't think it's better. Think of that float, that guy floating in the, in the water on a triathlon. He's probably an endurance and hit athlete anyway, versus somebody who does physical activity, walks their dog on a regular basis. Okay? Because it's not just the physical exercise, it's the hormonal exercise that's important as well. So physical activity is the second thing you can do. Third thing, no statins. Don't take a statin. And if you watch my video on the side effects of statins, and you look at the diabesogenic side of that, that's a concern. So no statins. Now, if you are in, if you're already on a statin and you've got high triglycerides and low HDL, triglycerides above 150 and HDL below, below 40, 39 or lower, if you're in that category, there may be value of a statin for a little while until you correct your numbers through your diet. But a baby aspirin a day is equivalent to that statin. But that's the one place, super high triglycerides, super low HDL. That's the one place until you correct that, that a statin may have some value. Other than that, the, the, the next most important thing is to take a baby aspirin a day. A baby, 81 milligram aspirin a day, unless there's a contraindication. The next one, um, and these are all uh, um, antioxidants. Make sure that your uric acid levels are not too high, but not too low. Make sure that you are on a 3 omega fatty acid, 3 omega fatty acid with at least 500 milligrams of DHA in it every day. Make sure you're taking some MCT oil or coconut oil. The MCT oils, coconut oils with the 3 omega fatty acids are the best cardiovascular fats you can get in. Take vitamin D3 or make sure your vitamin D3 levels by blood work are between 40 and 80 and that your calcium levels are between 9.5 and 9.8. If your vitamin D levels are low, 
D3K2, which affects the clotting system and affects repair of the blood vessels, um, make sure you get on the vitamin D3 supplement. And sunshine, those walks in the sunshine, we come back to the exercise, all of this folds into each other. Sunshine is also one of the best weapons, but check your vitamin D numbers and make, their, make sure they're okay. The next thing, and Cheryl on this channel, I would strongly recommend you go back and look at the vitamin C video that Cheryl did earlier on. Um, it's the one with the big lemons on it. Watch that video because vitamin C is essential, not just as an antioxidant, but also as a collagen matrix builder. And to repair your blood vessels, you need collagen. And taking collagen by mouth is totally useless. Well, it makes money for the company that's selling it to you, but it's useless to you as a taker. However, Adequate vitamin C levels is important. Whether you take it as a pill or take it as lemon or on a ketogenic diet, watch the vitamin C level. Don't just automatically reach for vitamin C pills. Watch the vitamin C level. Good blood pressure control. Good blood pressure control because hypertension and uh, diabetes are the two commonest promoters of cardiovascular disease. Smoking is the third to those. So adequate blood pressure control. And if your blood pressure is high, um, then take a medication for it. Don't be afraid of the medication, but the best thing you can do is monitor your blood pressure and your heart rate at home every day. Okay, very important. Don't smoke, no nicotine. Nicotine together with carbohydrates is the worst combination. Stop smoking, get on a smoking cessation program, including vaping. Vaping is not smoking cessation, it is smoke ongoing. Stop using nicotine products. If you want to use some marijuana, I'm okay with that, but I probably wouldn't smoke it. Probably wouldn't smoke it. I don't have a strong evidence on that. Um, not a big fan of marijuana, but certainly if, if it works for you, use it, but get off the nicotine. Um, as part of the blood work, make sure that we also look at some of your autoimmune markers, especially if your history, if your medical history points us in that direction. So the blood work, just circling back to that, is very, very important, very important. Um, then if you do have some form of insulin resistance, even if you're not diabetic, even if you're not diabetic, if you've got high, uh, 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 higher than uh, expected A1C, Use metformin and use a GLP-1 agonist, such as a Zempic or Trulicity or Manjaro, to help you to correct, not weight loss, it'll help, but to correct the insulin resistance. So use those two drugs to correct insulin resistance. Metformin, GLP-1 agonists, and aspirin are much better drug combination than a statin. Also, when you get your blood work done, make sure for boys and girls, we check estrogen and testosterone levels and we include DHEA sulfate because um, high estrogen levels will promote vascular inflammation. And if you're already slightly inflamed from hyperglycemia, the estrogen adds is a synergistic thing to cause a problem. Okay. And then know what your CAC score is. Get that CAC score done and then depending on what your original score is and your current age, then decide for yourself how often, or I'll help you to decide how often we need to repeat those tests. But get the check done, and if you warrant a, a, um, a referral to a cardiologist, um, I'll, I'm happy to tell you when it's time to see a cardiologist and hold your nose and go and see them, or the more and more friendly cardiologists, ketogenic friendly cardiologists that are not gonna push statins, go and see one of them. I have a few dotted around uh, that we can get to see, but make sure you take care of your heart while you prevent the disease. And if you follow that algorithm, if your strategy is ketogenic diet and exercise, three omega fatty acids, maybe some MCT oil and coconut oil, aspirin, maybe some metformin and a GLP-1 agonist for a while to correct your, to get become insulin sensitive, no statin, no smoking, good blood pressure control, blood work, autoimmune testing, um, uh, uh, male and female hormone testing and a CAC score, that is the algorithm we use. But folks, it's fine to go out and get that, but you need somebody that can put all these pieces of the puzzle together, interpret it for you, and manage you long term. Now, there are other people out there that do this in metabolic health, but this is what we do. This is what we do. And if you're interested, if you're interested in this, give us a shout. Um, 
561-517-0642. And we can do this from anywhere in the world. Can't necessarily do the blood work and stuff, but we can make the recommendations. You can get it done locally. We can help you to evaluate risk and, if, and set up a course of action for yourself if you're serious about this. Even if you've had a heart attack or a stroke and you're afraid of the next one, let's see what we can do to mitigate. But the best time to intervene is as young as you possibly can. And I can tell you that for the most part, where it's necessary, my son, who's almost three, he'll be three in August, he's two and a half right now, between two and a half and three, he has been following this regimen since he was a sperm and an egg. Just to put that out there. I am the carb addiction doc. If, I, if you listened this far, hopefully you smiled at the end, but hopefully you'll take action. And if you like this video, I keep these videos free. Yes, I've got some ads on these videos. Tolerate them because it keeps them free. And it's better to listen to my ads and throw a dollar at me than it is to listen to the Google, Google generic ads. Having said which, um, if you feel that this video has helped you, throw us a few dollars to the PayPal account down below. Until next time, take care.